We can wait a few minutes. Uh, this this is gonna. My other one almost always runs over, but this one is a little shorter. Okay. Is, is that the GI applicant? Yeah. I have to meet with him at four thirty. So. since I've been here uh, probably eight years now, and I think Dr. Taylor's been here since 2005. Correct. Is that right? Um, she started her medical career initially at John Hopkins Hospital, followed by Philadelphia, and then um, Boston for her pediatric residency training. She is um, our sole pediatric surgeon here. Uh, she will, of course, tell you in uh, her talk in the fall that she has She's not, she does not feel like she's the sole surgeon because she has ancillary help from several of our other surgical specialities. Um, if you remember her talk from the fall, um, she does such a wonderful job that I'm very, very excited to listen to her talk today about the why, how, and what of pediatric central lines. Before Dr. Taylor came to us here at Johnson City, she also practiced in Chapel North Carolina and brings a wealth of experience uh, to us. Her CV, as you can see, reads like a book. So without further ado, mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've given this talk for years. That actually, I put this talk together in Chapel Hill, so that was over 15 years ago, probably. Uh, but it's a topic that doesn't change at all. In fact, many of these slides I'll mention are from Chapel Hill patients. But um, this sort of got going to do this grand rounds when Dr. Keene and I were getting together about the septic infant needing IV access. And I'm glad to say we haven't had any of those middle of the night frantic calls of, you know, we have a kid that we can't get access, needs IV antibiotics, can't be fed, all this. So I think we're making progress. The title slide is actually the goals and objectives, meaning we're going to talk about the what, the who, the where, the when, the why, and the how uh, we do pediatric central lines. And I have nothing to disclose. If I happen to mention a brand name, I have no connection to any company. So this was a baby in Chapel Hill, Baby K. She's a three-month-old girl with Downs. She had duodenal atresia. She also had pure esophageal atresia. That means that there was no connection to the trachea. 
In pure esophageal atresia, the two ends of the esophagus are much further apart. You cannot do a repair in the first day or two of life. And you wait and you try to stretch that upper pouch. So that's why she's three months old when this is going on. And she just had a primary repair of her esophagus. Now she's in our NICU. This was in Chapel Hill. Um, and she needs TPN for another week. We don't want to feed in her stomach. We want to protect the repair of her esophagus for at least a week for that to heal. And when I looked at her, um, her external jugular veins were not visible. You may remember kids with Down syndrome sort of have no neck. And besides that, she had a fungal rash on her neck, so you can't go in the neck. Uh, she had dermatitis across her chest. And she'd already had some saphenous vein Broviac catheters when we were trying to get her through her surgery on the first uh, week of life for her duodenal atresia, placing her gastrostomy. And oh, by the way, we know that she's got some thrombosis in her right femoral vein already at three months of age. The radial art line is not really an issue, but that was one of her lines at the time. And so again, you're familiar with baby no neck, and it can be challenging. Uh, th this is not the patient, but uh, there's a certain age when they're, they're really just a lot of fat and you can't see much of anything. Um, so why do we put in central lines? One of the most common indications is antibiotic therapy. It could be long-term, like kids with cystic fibrosis, kids with mediastinitis, or orthopedic infections, osteomyelitis. We do obviously have St. Jude's here, and we do chemotherapy. We don't do bone marrow transplant here, but occasionally I've been asked to put in an additional line because the patient's going elsewhere to have their bone marrow transplant. We certainly do a lot of TPN. The most common would be for the short bowel syndrome. We've got a gastroschisis baby upstairs, hasn't been able to eat for five weeks. Um, inflammatory bowel disease in this region seems to be a much, much less common indication. We don't do solid organ transplant here anymore, but those patients frequently need long-term either antibiotics or other uh, infusions. Uh, certainly with uh, St. Jude here, we see the hemophiliac patients and sickle cell anemia and immunodeficiency patients. And sometimes it's not a particular indication like one of those others, it's just you can't get access. You just need it for regular IV fluids, but that can be a pretty challenging thing. And for the students, I just want to review what we're talking about. Uh, the peripheral access is obviously the, the hands and the legs and the scalp. And for the nurses, you don't have to ask me to put one in the scalp. Go ahead and put it in. I know you're required to ask, but I'm always going to say yes if you, ask, if you can do a scalp vein. And so this was a little patient I was called for. This was a two-week-old child, had vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, couldn't be fed. And I got the call to come and uh, evaluate the child for a line. And so the question that I had when I examined this baby very closely in the operating room was, well, they, they stuck this baby, what, six times here? That may have been for an art, uh, arterial glass. I don't know for sure. But uh, pokes here, both arms and legs look the same. Now, the good news, this was UNC Pediatric Service. This was not here. Um, so, but this was the same infant, and they had stuck this baby about like, at least five or six times on each side. And every minute that's ticking by, the baby's getting more and more dehydrated, can't be fed, and doesn't have IV access. So my plea here, and I haven't had a case as bad as this here, but just call early. Um, you can keep trying but just call early because sometimes we can't get into the operating room in a timely way. We need to make plans of what we can do. So what are our choices for central lines? Uh, Broviac is actually the name of the doctor, and I think Dr. Hickman is also, so those aren't brand names. Uh, but they developed a catheter. It's a tunnel catheter with a cuff. The cuff scars in, and that prevents the catheter from getting dislodged. And it comes in a single lumen and a double lumen version. The port. Um, is a, a chamber or reservoir. It's completely under the skin and all the catheter tubing is under the skin as well. And then the third option to get central access would be a, a non-cuffed and non-tunneled catheter either through the subclavian vein or the femoral vein. So Dr. J.W. Broviak, I looked him up, I think he's still practicing 44 years later, uh, and uh, he has just by developing a silicone catheter that allowed prolonged nutrition or, or a cost to chemotherapy or prolonged antibiotics, uh, he has saved thousands and thousands of lives because kids used to die for lack of access. And when this came along in 73, it was around the time that TPN was becoming a widely used. I mean, this was life-saving for many kids. So the um, most important part about the Broviac catheter is 
it doesn't, it can't slide out. The cuff scars in, that's the Dacron cuff. This would be the external portion, and then this portion would be tunneled under the skin uh, where you don't actually see it. <clears throat> and so you have the baby, it's pre pretty frequently, we'll put it on the chest. I'll show you some other sites where we do it. Um, the, I tend to bring it out on the chest, that's the easiest place to put the dressing, but this portion is tunneled. It goes in the vein here, and we want the tip in the central circulation right above the right atrium. So we have the single lumen Broviac catheter uh, with its Dacron cuff. So everything from here on out is external to the patient. Uh, it comes in double lumen. I only do that if uh, it's not routine to put in double lumen, only if the uh, oncologists say, you know, he, we have to have two separate uh, uh, lumens so that we don't have, have to mix incompatible infusions. Every, the more lumens you have, the more risk of infection. So you only want to use the number of lumens that you actually need. And the sizes, it really just boils down to four sizes, 2.7 French, 4.2 French, 6.6 French, and the 9.6 French. So I call everything a Broviac because the vast majority, now you may hear Hickman from Dr. Kelwinski or some of our oncologists even may still use Hickman, but they're all the same. It's an identical catheter. It's just the size uh, difference. And so the 2.7 French would be in a premature or a term newborn, 4.2 French in a toddler, 6.6 .6 French for the school-aged child, and I rarely, even if I have a teenager, I'm going to use the 6.6 .6 French. You want to use the smallest catheter that will do the job and not lead to clotting of the vein, because that can be very serious complication. The double lumen, the, really the only double lumen that I use is the 7.0 French. And the next type is the subcutaneous port. This is the type that is completely under the skin. Every part of it is under the skin. The issue here is you cannot put this in a patient that has ne needle phobia. They are not going to do well with this because you have to pass the needle through their skin every time. Now, you can numb the skin, but if you have somebody with needle phobia, numbing is not going to help. Uh, it comes in many different sizes and shapes over the years. And the most common one that I'm using now has uh, a feature where the, there's these little silicone knobs, and supposedly you're able to palpate those knobs and make it easier for the nurse or the physician to access the middle of the port. It does come as a double lumen, but it's very rare that we would put in a double lumen port. If somebody needs some, a double lumen, they're pretty sick. They probably need the Broviac catheter that's going to be used more frequently. And um, remember that if one chamber gets infected, then you sometimes have to take the whole port out. So what's uh, the way we use the port is we use a very special needle, the Huber needle, um, and it's got a very special tip on it. It's got a very sharp uh, tip that does not core out a hole. If you use a regular needle, it will puncture a hole and take that little silicone plug out, and then you end up with a sieve instead of on the uh, dome instead of um, a, a slit that will close. And that's why we had a patient recently where we've been having a lot of difficulty in an obese patient where we don't have a long enough Huber needle. Um, you can't just use any regular needle. It, it won't, it's got complications. You can look up online. They, they, there's been lawsuits about that. So this is the very sharp Huber needle. It usually comes with the tubing so that uh, you can attach it to your infusion. And again, this cannot be used for a patient that has needle phobia. It's also not good for TPN. It's not good uh, for 24-hour usage. You're going to break down the skin if you're using it that much. It's very good for intermittent infusion. So somebody that needs once a month infusion has terrible veins, and you have a reliable access. So the third type of central catheter is the non-tunneled, non-cuffed, and you just sew this to the skin. These are not meant to last for months. The patient really can't go home with this. There's, I, don't, I don't know of a nursing uh, service in the area that will take a patient at home with a, one of these catheters. You're just sewing it in for a few weeks, and this would be in the, saphen um, in the femoral or the uh, subclavian vein. It comes in triple lumens, but remember, each lumen that you're trying to squeeze in, the, the patient's vein is uh, still the same size. Um, and I've had nurses, not here necessarily, but ask, you know, can we have a double lumen in this preemie? Well, you can't. The, the, the lumens are just too small. And so each of these lumens is, is small to fit them all three lumens into one catheter. And the most important thing about putting in the, uh, these uh, non-cuffed ones, 
uh, sewing it in. In the kit, they give you silk. The problem with silk, it's irritating to the skin. The stitches tear through, and before you know it, you've lost your line. Now, I've seen much less of that here than I used to see in Chapel Hill, so I think you're doing a good job even if you're using the silk. But I actually recommend um, using at least five to seven nylon sutures to sew this in. Uh, otherwise, you know, the patient's already gone through the risk of either the sedation or the anesthetic to have this done. And you notice if we can tape it off to the back side of the patient, they're less likely to play with it and pull it out. So always secure them. I just put in five to seven sutures. I put in uh, the two on the wings and at least two or three more to, to keep that in. Other central catheters, obviously, are the pick lines. And uh, so this is... Uh, put in by interventional radiology or the NICU staff puts in the infant uh, central venous lines. Uh, you can also consider umbilical venous arterial lines, central lines, and those, I don't do any of those, you do all of those. Uh, those are put in by the NICU staff. So for the students, the PICC line, the peripherally inserted central catheter, it can go in a peripheral vein, but it's very long, it's threaded, and the tip is in the, uh, just above the right atrium. You're gonna check this with x-ray, and um, these can last weeks or months even if they're well cared for. So this is the infant uh, peripherally inserted uh, central catheter, and we have great NICU nurses here that can get these in just about any size baby. And this is really terrific. Suppose this baby can't eat for a couple weeks, they're recovering from a surgery, or they had gastroschisis or a bowel resection. Uh, they don't absolutely have to have a Broviac, they can have a PICC line for their TPN. And it doesn't even have to be in there. Uh, it, it can be central. This is actually a central line. It, it's going in a scalp vein, going down into the central circulation from a scalp vein. And this is the umbilical venous catheter that, as I said, you put these in. I don't do them. But the same idea is that you're putting your infusion into the central circulation. I would also mention interosseous line, although this would only be the emergency situation. Uh, obviously, this was a trauma. It was not my patient. Um, but the, my experience with these is they have a very short lifespan, uh, and you do want to get them out pretty quick if you can get any other kind of access, but this can be life-saving in certain situations, and I would consider it more than a peripheral line. Other types of venous access that can be used long-term is the midline. Um, for a while, we got away from midlines. I guess they're starting to place them again because you have a, somebody that will come to the floor and put these in with ultrasound. And they can be very useful in some patients that have poor access. Um, but the midline, it goes in, th just like the pick line, it goes in through a peripheral vein, usually antecubital, but it could be um, up higher in the arm. Um, but it stops right here, and so you cannot do certain infusions with this. You cannot give caustic chemotherapy or caustic antibiotics or full strength TPN. And um, I took care of a CF child in Chapel Hill who uh, had many midlines. And when I went to put in the, uh, he then came for longer term access, he had completely thrombosed this uh, vein uh, just from prior midlines. So it, it does have its own complications. But the this true central line, peripherally inserted central line, you can infuse um, full strength TPN, uh, caustic chemotherapy, that sort of thing. So who puts in lines? The first people that I would say to call if you think you need access is either interventional radiology or the NICU staff. Always give them the first call. I don't mind being called if you're calling them. I don't mind being called as the backup so I'm aware of the patient. If they can't get it, then we already have a backup plan for the patient. But many, many, many kids can get through their three weeks of antibiotics or whatever with their pick line. So we're, we're sort of the backup service here. In Chapel Hill, we actually had um, interventional radiologists that could be in, put in transhepatic and translumbar catheters, um, but obviously that's pretty highly specialized, and we haven't needed the, anybody here to get one of those because we're, we're doing well at, at, at keeping lines in um, with uh, the, these two types of lines. Now, I would say, and I may not have picked the right, maybe, Doc, are there any nurse practitioners here? Uh, maybe Dr. Vo can speak to this. So at a certain age, the NICU nurse practitioner says, no, that baby's too big. But then you get the VIR person up there, and they say, no, that baby's too small. We, we can't do that baby. He's too small. So um, this is, fortunately doesn't happen all that often. But if they're too big for the NICU nurse to try, and they're too small for radiology to try, um, there's a grade zone. I call them orphans. 
uh, they're the ones that are going to have to go to the operating room and get an anesthetic to have a Broviac catheter put in by me, even if they only need, you know, may only end up needing one week of antibiotics while you wait for the culture uh, results, and that's okay. Uh, what else can you do? You can't get peripheral access. They, they fall through the cracks of these two uh, weight ranges, and you're just going to have to uh, take that. And the next question to ask is, what catheter does the patient need? Well, the, the questions to ask are, how long do they need it? Do they need it just for two or three days while you're waiting for cultures? Do they, you know they have osteomyelitis, they need it for six weeks, so you want them to go home with a catheter? Um, and what prior catheters have they had? How many have they had? Um, where have the catheters been? Have all the good easy sites been used up? Also very important to consider is, does the patient have a coagulopathy? You don't want to put a catheter in where you can't tamponade it if you hit the subclavian artery and you don't have an easy way to tamponade that and they've got a coagulopathy. Um, or they already have had multiple lines, they've already thrombosed many of their uh, more easy vessels. Um, or the thing about cystic fibrosis is, um, you know, you'd rather not put that child to sleep in with bad lungs if you don't have to. Um, so we think about all those as when we're deciding what catheter is going to be best. Another part of that decision is how long is a catheter going to be useful for and can the child go home with the catheter or do they have to stay in the hospital for weeks and weeks? And we've had some kids, uh, I think there was a memorable kid here with MRSA sepsis that he couldn't go home. He stayed here for weeks to get his IV antibiotics, uh, even though he had a catheter that would have allowed him to go home. So the tunnel cuff catheters, the Broviac catheters, they can be in for years, and you can definitely use them at home. We have many kids at home with those. The port definitely can go home, and that uh, will last for years. Uh, the pick line, that's sometimes dependent on the age of the patient. If they're a very active young child, that pick line is not going to last very long. Uh, if it's a more sedate older child, um, they might be able to go home with that. And I, Dr. Bo, I think it's still true you don't send the NICU babies home with pick lines. Yeah. So the NICU baby won't go home with a pick line. They would have, if they need longer term antibiotics, they would have to go home with, a, they have to get a general anesthetic to get a Broviac. So usually the um, ones that are non tunneled, non cuffed, uh, you're going to uh, treat those, keep those in the hospital. Usually these are the kids in the PICU, they may be on the vent, they may be getting multiple infusions. Um, and, but they're just for hospital use. And when is general anesthesia required? Well, for the Broviac, they need general anesthesia. If it's in the NICU and the baby's already intubated, uh, we can, I can do it in the NICU without uh, having to take the baby to the operating room. The port definitely needs anesthesia. You've got to create a pocket on the chest, uh, and that's a little bit of dissection, and that, that's a longer procedure that does require general anesthesia. So the non-tunneled, non-cuffed, either the subclavian vein or the femoral veins, place at bedside in the PICU by the in, uh, intubated or sedated by either Dr. Coy, Dr. Lucas, or myself. And um, Dr. Coy, by the way, told me he does not do PICC lines. And I don't do PICC lines uh, because they, we have other providers that can do PICC lines. So um, you're, you're going to call radiology for a PICC line or NICU staff. And this is a perfect candidate for a, um, can anybody dim these upper lights here? Because some of the x-rays aren't going to show as well. I don't know if anybody can. Um, so this baby, intubated, a little bit sick. Um, you don't want to have to take this baby downstairs. You could. We move babies, intubated babies around. We do. But it's so great that we can just, I can put a Broviac catheter at bedside in this patient. Thank you. And, and these two, if you know where they are. Um, and not have to move this baby uh, an intubated baby, baby downstairs. And for other lines, conscious sedation, of course, that depends on the patient's ability to cooperate it. If it's an older teenager, they may not need conscious sedation. Uh, if it's a challenged child or a younger child, they definitely will need conscious sedation for their pick line placement. Now, what veins can we use? Where can we put these lines? Well, the, there's many veins. Um, the vein that I prefer is the external jugular vein. Facial vein is available, but it's much deeper. Saphenous vein in some situations. I don't use the internal jugular vein very often, and the cephalic vein I haven't used that in years. So really for me, it's the external jugular vein and the saphenous vein. And here's, the again, the typical way we would put in a Broviac catheter um, by cut-down technique in an a, uh, external jugular vein. Um, we make an incision on the chest. The catheter is tunneled. 
uh, between this, this cuff is here. I usually put the cuff a little bit closer down there. But this portion is tunneled under the skin. This portion is intravenous. And again, the tip is going to be right above, preferably right above the right atrium. And so here is the um, external jugular vein in the neck. And apparently, um, the best way to see an external jugular vein is if you're an athlete, <laughs> um, particularly if you're an angry athlete. <laughs> um, so here is the external jugular vein. And once you, I don't know if it's just because I have to find this vein to put things in it, but I notice external jugular veins on everybody all the time. Uh, <laughs> so here is uh, uh, Piston's uh, basketball player, uh, angry, I guess. I don't even know who this is, but uh, there's his external jugular vein there. This guy, uh, very happy about his win or something, and uh, here's his external jugular vein. And uh, here you can see uh, this guy's external jugular vein here. So fortunately, if you have a slender child, uh, it's not that hard, particularly if they're laughing or somehow they've increased their central venous pressure. Uh, there's the external vein right there. So many, many times we can see it, not always if they're overweight, but um, usually you can find it pretty easily, particularly if you put them in Trendelenburg to help look for it. So the next sequence of slides is, uh, uh, these slides were taken by another pediatric surgeon in Chapel Hill, but they um, are, are excellent examples. So uh, the baby's intubated in the NICU. There's the external jugular vein. This baby's not even in Trendelenburg. You can see it very well. The right nipple is a landmark. Um, and we always have to have them intubated. We can't, it can't be just a sedation. They cannot move uh, when we're doing this, so they have to be paralyzed. So we've got the external jugular vein identified here. And we, uh, so this is taken slightly different angle. The nipple's down here. Make a small incision right over the vein. And again, you can usually see it. We've got the vein isolated here. Put some ties around it. And now we're going to decide where it's going to, where's the exit site? Where's the catheter going to dangle out from the patient? Well, particularly in a girl, you do not want to put it in their nipple. And remember, a premature infant, that's hard to find sometimes. It's very hard to find the nipple. But I always make sure I know exactly where that is if I'm doing a premature. This surgeon chose to put it lateral. I find it more difficult to dress this site near the armpit. I would put it usually medial to the nipple. Uh, you could put it up here. Um, but just not at the nipple. This is how we tunnel it. Um, this is the exit site, and that's the, where the venotomy is. Uh, and this is called a silver probe, and it's just a, a, thing, a metal rod to help pass the catheter. So we're going to pull the catheter through that tunnel. That'll become the subcutaneous portion. We're going to cut it to an appropriate length. Oh, how did, oops, I hit the wrong button there. And um, now, I would not recommend this technique. You notice that this surgeon doesn't have a handle on this knife. Uh, that's not recommended. However, he's making a little venotomy in the vein. And then we just pass the catheter in that's already been tunneled. So here's the tunnel portion of the catheter. Pass it into the vein. Secure it in the vein. And then check for blood flow. You're going to suture this in. You're going to uh, uh, close this incision here. And if we were in the operating room, I would get fluoroscopy. But I can do this at the bedside in the NICU without fluoroscopy. Um, and we just get a, an immediate chest x-ray and be sure the catheter has gone central. Rarely it decides to go across to the left shoulder instead of going central. And you're done. And uh, this can take, if everything's flowing right, this can take 15 minutes to do at the bedside in the NICU. And you've got a, a central line immediately available for use. Now, this little girl had, this was a patient in Chapel Hill, and this uh, mother allowed me to use this photo. Um, two striking things about this photo. One, this mother did not try to hide the scar. This mother had accepted this child's care and all the scars that came along with it. The second thing is that um, you notice the girl's tan line. So intentionally, particularly in girls, I'm going to put the exit site somewhere within uh, where it's going to be hidden by a swimsuit top or a bra. Um, and you know, obviously, there's some low-cut dresses this child cannot wear. But uh, over time, this scar will improve. You got to think ahead. You know, it's going to be a teenager wanting to go to the prom. Um, so we think ahead. And you know, the, the scar will be there forever. It just won't be that red for, uh, for long. 
You can also tunnel it out in the back of the head. Now, I've never done this. Even in a premature infant, they've got hair back there, so I don't know how anybody would ever um, put a you know, tape or adhesive or tegaderm on this. But this is one way to keep it away from the baby grabbing at it. Uh, but it's still, they've got it going into the internal jugular vein. But the idea is we can bring the, the exit part of the, or the external part of the catheter out anywhere. And this even proves the point. Now, I think I've only had to do this once here in 10 years. Um, we had one little autistic boy that had severe short bowel syndrome from omphalocele, ruptured omphalocele. And he would play with his cat, when it was on his chest, he would play with it, he would, you know, suck it, and, uh, you know, it was, he was in the hospital just about every month with an infection. So the good news here is we don't see nearly as many infected lines as I used to see. Um, and, but in a real extreme case, if you just uh, can't keep the child from playing with it or taking off their dressing or whatever's happening, you can tunnel it out the back. It's a little bit more technically difficult, but the, this slide is really just to say you can bring that catheter out anywhere uh, that is most convenient. Again, I don't use the right facial vein anymore because I've had success uh, with the other two veins, and it's a, just a deeper um, dissection to get to it. So the saphenous vein comes up and joins the femoral vein in the groin here. And um, you have the choice here. Um, you can tunnel the cat. Here's the cuff, the exit, the external part of the catheters up on the abdomen. Um, I actually prefer to bring that out on the thigh because to me, this is still in the diaper area. And you don't want, uh, if the baby has a, um, you know, blowout stool and it goes all the way up and comes out the diaper, you don't want your central line, uh, you know, covered with stool. Now, it could happen if it's on the thigh too, but I tend to bring it out on the mid-thigh. And, and that would be, I only use this mostly in kids that are not crawling or walking. Uh, so this is a, a site that can be well used in younger, uh, you know, intubated patients that are in the NICU uh, where they're not trying to get up and crawl and walk around. And this is the other problem that we have. This uh, baby had severe short bowel syndrome from necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, needed long-term TPN, and you cannot use either of these saphenous veins because uh, you're going to get a fungal infection. And uh, so it's very important to treat that even in a child that doesn't have their catheter in that site. Uh, the cephalic vein is in the deltal pectoral groove. That's also a deeper, if, again, if you've used up their, IG, their um, in, for some reason, their internal jugular thrombosis or their um, external jugular thrombosis, uh, there is another route to go, but I haven't had to use this one in years. Now, those veins that I just showed you, we cut down to them. We make an incision in the skin, we dissect down and get the vein and put the catheter directly into the vein. So the other technique, which you're familiar with if you've done the non-tunneled catheters, is the Seldinger technique. It's the wire technique. And we put it in the subclavian vein or the femoral vein or interventional radiology, at least in Chapel Hill, uh, they would do some internal jugular veins. And they would do these highly, highly specialized transhepatic or translumbar catheters. Those were in kids that had thrombosed everything else. Uh, they thrombosed uh, all their uh, upper central veins, all their lower central veins, but because of the high flow from the liver uh, to the vena cava, you could still find an opening that wasn't thrombosed there because of the high flow. So they would put it in a hepatic vein uh, into the vena cava. Um, so here's the approach for the subclavian vein, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. And um, so again, you're uh, creating a, a subcutaneous portion with the cuff. Uh, you're going into the vein with the tip at the central circulation. So we use a dilator and sheath, uh, a wire, and this sheath is special because it peels away into two halves, and you're actually peeling this away in, inside the vein, and as the two parts of it are peeling into two halves, uh, it, it, it's coming out of the vein, and it's, it's a pretty cool technique. Um, so here's the peel away sheath peeling away. Again, this is, you're doing this peel away while it's actually in the patient's vein, but this allows this to come out. And you've already tunneled your catheter, you've thread your catheter, you've already got your um, puncture of your vein, you've passed the wire in, you've passed the sheath and dilator over the wire. Now you've got, you pull the dilator out, you've got just the sheath, you're putting your catheter into the sheath, and here's the catheter tip over here, and as you peel this away, this is coming out, but the catheter is staying in the central circulation. 
So that's a Selinger percutaneous technique. And you end up with two halves of your peel away sheath. So here's the very specialized technique, which again, we haven't had to use here because we, we seem to keep lifespan of our catheters is longer here or whatever, uh, less than both kids. Um, but this would be done by interventional radiology. They'd actually go through the liver and find the hepatic vein and with the wire uh, and fluoroscopy thread the catheter up into the uh, right atrium, coming retrograde up into the right atrium. And you might say, well, they're going to have liver abscess or they're going to have liver hemorrhage. Well, believe it or not, these had very few complications. It was pretty amazing when we were able to do those. And so this is the x-ray. Here's the external portion of the catheter. This would be intrahepatic. It's entering an hepatic vein somewhere here and coming up into the uh, right atrium approximately here. Now, we'll move on to complications. Uh, unfortunately, it's just part of life. You just have to accept that if you're putting foreign body into somebody, they're going to have complications. The simplest one would be granulation tissue, just like what we see around G-tubes. You can get granulation tissue at the site. This weeps a murky fluid. It can confuse people because it can look pussy. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's infected. It, you just need to uh, cauterize the granulation tissue. Uh, Broviac cuff exposure can occur. Infection of the tract can occur, and with ports, unfortunately, they can be skin erosion or port exposure uh, from breakdown of the skin. So here's the simplest, um, and again, there, there's the cuff there. Uh, this person just is reacting to this cuff with this granulation tissue. You can use the silver nitrate. Sometimes it's just the stitch that is uh, irritating them. You take that, take that stitch off after three weeks and uh, cauterize that, and that's a pretty simple cure right there. Unfortunately, if somebody has accidentally jerked on the line and they've got an exposed cuff, uh, the first question, and this kid already had a facial vein and there's the scar from the external jugular vein. He's already had several. Um, your question here, well, two more days, you could get them through two more days. Two more years, you're probably going to have to replace that line. They're not going to make it through two years or probably even two months uh, with the cuff just sort of tenuous outside. But um, if you keep this under a sterile dressing, you can get along with it. For example, here's a baby that was put prone for pulmonary um, uh, issues and very thin skin in this preemie, and it eroded the cuff there. But again, keeping it under a sterile dressing, that, the, the cuff erosion does not mean you have to take that Broviac out. You can work with it for a few weeks. And this one, uh, same thing. This is really no different, even though the cuff is out, as long as it's sterilely dressed um, and you've got something securing it, uh, this is just like a percutaneous central line, uh, the, the non-tunneled ones. Um, here's a young man with a uh, eroded uh, port. Uh, this you'd have to work with again. How much longer do they need this catheter? Um, and you know what are their comorbidities of putting a new one in? You might be able to, you know, treat this with antibiotics, get this to heal, and and go continue on with that port. Now this one, no, no chance of that. You're just going to have to take this out, start over at another site. Now, as hard as we try, and I know the nurses try to be very careful with the catheters, and parents do, but catheters do get jerked on inadvertently. The dog, I've had the story they came from home, and the dog ran through the tubing, and it jerked the catheter. But anyway, so traction dislodgement, just somebody accidentally jerking on it, getting tangled up. And of course, when you have this in a toddler, uh, you know, it's amazing that this doesn't happen more often. Now, sometimes uh, it can be something internal where the tip is pushed around by clot, and so the tip migrates. So, as I was saying earlier, I prefer, and uh, this was from Chapel Hill, nobody here. Um, this uh, was sewn in only with two sutures, silk sutures, and this one already tore through the skin. So this catheter dislodged. And this child, I think, had a mediastinitis uh, from a heart surgery. Um, so it's not right to push that back in. Baby came to the operating room to have a more permanent access put in. But had that been secured better, maybe they wouldn't have had to have that anesthetic. And the other thing you'll notice here is, well, this is hanging right down by the colostomy bag. And unfortunately, I see this all the time. And in an infant with a colostomy bag, and you've got a couple if, over the years you've seen, or a G-tube, and I find the central line just dangling right on top of the G-tube in the colostomy bag. And it's not rocket science, there's bacteria there. And that's gonna increase the risk of infection. So this needs to be taped over the shoulder or somehow coiled so it's taped far away from anything that's full of bacteria. 
So this was a little guy in Chapel Hill. He was a former preemie with short bowel from severe necrotizing enterocolitis. He was about two at this time. You notice he's got very dilated bowel, which is a response to short bowel syndrome. And um, he also has a VP shunt. Here you can follow this VP shunt down. Um, actually, he has a, vent a ventriculopleural shunt. Because his abdomen was hostile, they could not put his ventricular shunt in his abdomen, so they put it in his chest. Um, so he's a complicated kid. And so when I put this Broviac catheter in, if I do say so myself, it was an excellent position with the tip uh, right here at the uh, right atrium. And it's a subclavian line. You can see it coming along the subclavian uh, there. And one night he came into the emergency room and he was having symptoms of burning with infusion of his TPN, which is never, that should never happen. That's something's wrong if they're having that symptom. And so on a Saturday night, the UNC uh, Chapel Hill resident uh, whoops, read this as okay. Now they didn't call me. I wasn't even aware of the visit until four days later. But this is not where I left it. Remember, I left it down here. So something has happened to that tip and we even have a side view, that, that is not in the, that's probably found its way into some other peripheral or some other um, vein. Um, and unfortunately, um, four days later, I found out about the issue of the patient, you know, hadn't been getting TPN as well because it was uncomfortable. And this did require replacement of that catheter. But I get a chest X-ray after every line that I place so that we have the documentation that it, it was right in the right place when, when we left the operating room. So this was a little boy with CF, this was also in Chapel Hill, that had a port placed by another partner. And if you look at this port and say, okay, where's the central line? Well, he came to clinic to me, I think it was about three years after somebody had placed the port, and uh, his leg was swelling up. So I took a history and got an x-ray, and that, that line that had been a central line going up towards the heart, it had fallen into his uh, femoral vein, and of course that was causing femoral vein occlusion, and his leg was swelling up, and about all we could do was, you know, start over. I, I would never put a port down here. It's just not a, I mean, it's a dirty, it's more dirty area, even though this boy was older, not in diapers, but um, I, I, the chest is a much better place to put a port because you've got the solid, or you've got the um, rib cage to push against when you're trying to access the port. Now, um, I don't remember the exact circumstances of this patient, but um, this was also in Chapel Hill where somehow, it was uh, not my patient or it happened months later or something, the, um, I don't even see the port, but uh, this portion of the uh, catheter migrated to the heart. Fortunately, if you've got good vent interventional radiologists, they can actually snare this from a femoral approach. And that's what we did to get it out, and that was over 10 years ago. They were able to get that out from uh, just snaring it from a femoral vein approach. Now, what do we do if the catheter breaks? And we'll talk about two ways that it can break. The external catheter can break or the internal. We have repair kits, and we can repair the external catheter all sizes. And uh, a couple summers ago, I was finishing up in the clinic about 6 o'clock at night, and I got a 911 page to 3100 to the floor. And I said, well, what can be 911 that they need if there's not somebody there? And they said, well, the catheter is broken. And um, I forget exact, but the, it had completely broken off. And I forget the scenario of how that happened. Uh, but this is what I looked like when I uh, <laughs> got that call. So here it is, 6 o'clock at night. I've got to go over. And, and uh, uh, these repairs almost always seem to happen at night. I don't know why that is. It's very rare that I repair a catheter in the daytime, but it's true. And uh, this is another way that this catheter can break. This one, there's actually two tubes. There's this outer tube, and then there's an inner tube. And uh, this one, the outer tube is broken, but you're going to have to, you can repair this. Um, and the one thing that I would say for both the nurses and physicians is this says right here, it says clamp here. And they've got two arrows, clamp here. Unfortunately, I come by, I find this clamp up here. And that's how you get that breakage. And it's totally preventable. You just got to clamp on the thick portion. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's not that hard because it tells you exactly where to clamp. So this is the repair segment. Uh, this is all of the external part. Um, and the, that's a little metal stent that fits in. This is, you can't see it very well. That's a silicone sheath. And uh, these repairs, um, the patient does not have to be sedated. Well, let me take that back. They don't have to be asleep. If they're a toddler who cannot cooperate, they may need sedation. 
an infant, they don't, ha you know, if they can just lay there and not be, uh, if they can be restrained easily as an infant, then you can do this without any sedation. It's the toddler age group where you're not going to be able to do the repair at, without at least sedation. And um, this little guy actually is going home today from your service. Uh, he has short bowel. He's waiting for his bowel transplant from Duke. And um, he, for a while last fall, he was having multiple visits to the emergency room, almost always after 10 o'clock at night. And one time I repaired the catheter, and within a few days he was back. And the grandmother brought me this. And I realized, well, she was hooking up three, um, this three-prong extension to this where the repair was. I mean, the repair is just silicone glue. Um, and so that had caused the breakage that particular time. The breakage was from, it was just too heavy. Uh, it was, it, the glue couldn't, hadn't, uh, you know, formed a tight, tight enough seal, uh, and the weight of it was just too much. Um, and this is a segment. This actually represents four repairs, plus the fifth one is the repair that allowed us to remove this. Uh, so that's one repair, two repair, three repair, four repairs, plus the repair that was here that, that this was taken off. And the little guy going home today waiting for the bowel transplant, he currently has four repairs in his line. They're all taped together on his chest. And that saved him four or five anesthetics in the operating room. And that saved that vein. In, in any short bowel kid, you want to, every vein is precious. You have to do everything you can not to have to reuse or use every vein um, without care. Um, now, you can also get breakage of the subcutaneous or the internal portion of the catheter. Um, and we had one of these recently, but actually it was just uh, in September, I think. Um, and so when I took this out, I, I flushed some water through it. Here's the stitch that was sewing it to the skin. There's the cuff. And so this is all under the skin, so there's no way I could repair that. If the tear was here, I could repair it. Anything under the skin, I can't. I have to just replace it. So I wanted to really demonstrate this is betadine, and that is the... Um, hole there. Now, it's extremely rare that a catheter get, I test the catheters before I put them in. I don't know how this child got this hole. It's extremely rare that a Broviac catheter fails in this way. Um, but here you can see there, um, the inner tube has broken and blood has seeped between the two tubes. And this one also is just going to ha uh, uh, have to be uh, repaired uh, by, by um, redoing it. Um, I, I don't think you can do an external repair on that, you're going to have to replace the catheter. Unfortunately, being in the bloodstream, these can clot. You can get fibrin buildup on the catheter tip itself or actually thrombosis of the patient's veins. So there's two parts to it. So there's a catheter clotting or the vein clotting or many times both. And so here's the fibrin that builds up and includes the, the little holes of the catheter. And there's many ways that the fibrin can uh, cause a problem. It can just line the catheter, and that's not a problem. But if it's the strandy stuff, so the nurse will call and say, well, I can infuse fine, but when I tried to get that blood culture, I couldn't get any blood back. Well, what may be happening is it's, when, you, when they're aspirating, it's just sucking that fibrin up and, and occluding it. So the infusion is fine, but trying to withdraw is not so easy. Now, if you have a clotted catheter, TPA can be used in any of these catheters, and just contact us, and as soon as you suspect a clotted catheter, uh, the earlier we can get it declotted, the better. Now, this is a, obviously a child that was receiving chemotherapy, not here, um, and you say, well, that's a great external jugular vein. But in fact, in this case, it was a sign of superior vena cava syndrome, which means that the, all the central veins had clotted and so that's why some of the smaller accessory veins were um, being distended. And, and that's not good because it's much harder to get uh, a line in this type of patient if everything is clotted. Now, a very common question is, can you draw blood from the line? And I'm always, I always have to be the bad guy because I, I always say no. Um, but sometimes we put the port in just so they can have frequent blood drawing, and that's okay. Um, with the tunnel catheter, the larger sizes, you can do it, but I, I personally strongly discourage it. If you don't flush it immediately or, or really get that um, blood uh, out of the catheter, you d decrease the lifespan of the catheter because clot forms in there. Now, the 2.7 is very hard to draw back, and I strongly discourage it. Again, it's, you're just going to clot off that catheter, shorten the life of the catheter. In the operating room, I always assure that I can 
infuse and withdraw, but I discouraged withdrawing blood. Now I know it's hard on the nurses because they have to stick these kids, um, but you know, having to go back to the operating room for another catheter is a bad thing too. With the PICC lines, I'm pretty sure you're not allowing blood drawing. Infection, um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. More and more, um, we have um, better and better antibiotics and antifungals. In the old days, 20, 30 years ago, a fungal infection, they'd call us, we immediately take the catheter out. We just didn't have a chance on clearing that line. But more and more, as we have better antifungals, we can try to clear the catheter of the infection, and sometimes we succeed. But you're always going to have to ask the question, you know, is this their 10th line and they don't have any more easy veins left? Um, and how long do they need the line for? Now, comes the time the patient no longer needs the catheter. Um, for a port, they're going to have to have it out under general anesthesia. For a Breviac catheter, it, there's four separate considerations. If it's an inpatient or an outpatient, if it's an infant or an older child or toddler. So let's start, we'll take each one in turn. So the inpatient infant, they don't know what's, they don't have fear. They may have a little pain, but they don't have fear. They don't need conscious sedation. They don't need to be NPO. They can have a pacifier. I do address their pain. I'll give them some xylocaine, some um, acetaminophen. I'll give them some morphine if the line is working. Put some uh, cream on there, the topical cream to numb it. Um, and we can just swallow up the infant. I can. Uh, do this uh, in the treatment room. They don't have to go to the operating room, and it's a very short procedure. Now, if it's an outpatient infant, same thing in the clinic. I don't have any sedation in the clinic, but uh, the parents can uh, put the um, topical anesthetic on prior to coming to the clinic. They can give the acetaminophen before the clinic. I can give them a little injection of local at the time, give them a sugar pacifier. They just swaddle it up, and we do it in the clinic room. Uh, just make an appointment in the clinic. And usually those kids I'm following anyway. They've gone home with their catheter. We know they're going to need it out in three more weeks or something like that. If it's an inpatient toddler or older, I'm going to get Dr. Coy involved. Or if it's uh, other considerations, they can't have a conscious sedation in the PICU, then we go to the operating room. And they may need to be NPO based on what kind of sedative they're going to be given. If it's an outpatient toddler, there's no way you're going to remove this in the clinic. You cannot sedate them in the clinic. They're going to have to just be booked for a general anesthesia uh, here as an outpatient. And then they're going to have to be NPO, usually for eight hours. Now, if we pay attention to all the things that I just mentioned of relieving pain and, and putting the patient in the right setting for their catheter removal, then you're going to have a relaxed patient uh, getting their care while they're in the hospital. So this is a little guy with a Wilms tumor, not from here. I think he's got a port here. He had another Broviac here placed elsewhere, but he was ready to get his Broviac catheter out. So I've got this sequence of slides. He wanted, obviously, to be asleep under a brief general anesthesia. We're going to prep this site. Um, with the stitches were there. I've, I just leave the stitches in until they pull through the skin. Um, I used to take them out, but that's a lot of trouble. But here we are. He's asleep, ready to have it removed. We're going to cut the stitches, gentle traction. We dissect around the cuff, and I'm usually leaving the cuff right here. If you leave it higher up, it's much harder to get it out. And you notice we're not even using a knife. Here's the cuff coming into view. It's covered with fibrin. That's the scarring in that has helped that catheter not get jerked out. That, in fact, it's, sometimes it's pretty hard to get these catheters out. So we want to f see that full cuff, and now we see the full cuff in view. It's covered with fibrin, but we're clipping the fibrin sheath around it and finally coming around, and this last snip will allow it to be free. And literally, we can take a Broviac catheter out in about the amount of time it took me to show you those slides. Uh, so it's a pretty short procedure, but um, again, they're going to have to be asleep if they're an older child. And then just some steri strips. It'll heal the same with stitches or not. So this is uh, one of the more important slides to show you because you are the ones admitting these patients that may be dehydrated or have cancer or have an infection. And so the first question you're going to ask when you realize you need more than a peripheral is, can this patient be a candidate for a PICC line? So call interventional radiology or call the NICU staff if that, or the NICU nurse uh, practitioner if you think it's appropriate for that patient. But if, you, if it's not a candidate for a PICC line, then call me 
but you need to know some answers to these questions is when is it needed? If you, if you have no ability to get any access, you need it right away, just call. Uh, or later in the day, uh, we can take the time to wait till they're more NPO or not. Or tomorrow, try to call early. Um, and if you're anticipating, you know, you've got the culture back, you know, okay, it's going to be six weeks for osteomyelitis, and we can put it on, he's got a functioning peripheral, we can put it on a day or two later, um, give us that information. But we're also going to ask, when did the patient eat? And if you have any suspicion that you're going to need a central line, just keep the patient MPO. I know it's hard, uh, particularly if they don't have a peripheral, but I'll respond immediately and try to make the plan to get them to the operating room. Um, and start a peripheral if you can. Um, and what the access does the patient have now? If they have no access, obviously that's a little bit more urgent if they really need the fluids or whatever. If they have a functioning peripheral IV, that's fine. We can even put them to sleep through their infected Broviac if we're taking them there to take out the Broviac. Uh, or there may be other considerations. Um, and what prior catheters, of course this is more a question for me, but you might have information of what prior catheters they had. Is it going to be used in-house or as an outpatient? More questions. Uh, is it going to be needed for less than three weeks? Probably stay as an inpatient. Consider a subclavian vein catheter like Dr. Coy can put in. Um, or if it's going to be greater than three weeks or they want to go home, that's when you're going to consider the Broviac catheter. And then it's embarrassing to get the operating room, have the nurse take down the diaper and say, oh, the baby has a hernia and you haven't done a complete exam. And by the way, you want, need to fix the hernia while you're there to put the line in. So we try to do a, um, a full exam and occasionally the parent will want something else done while they're going to sleep. Um, and obviously the oncologist can come in and do their part while the patient's asleep. We coordinate that frequently. Um, and also, does the patient have any comorbidities? We're going to need to give them FFP or platelets or blood transfusion to get them through their anesthetic. So here's the general guidelines. Uh, if it's an inpatient, just contact us early, uh, the earliest that you can. Then we get in line in the operating room much easier. And I might even be able to get an elective time. And then I can tell the parents, yes, you're going at 2 o'clock when I finish my outpatient list. Um, otherwise, if we have a very late uh, add-on or we're waiting in line, by the way, children get no priority in the operating room here. Being a child doesn't count for anything in the main operating room. You wait behind, you're a child, you wait behind adults. And so the sooner we can know to put that patient on, say it's a Saturday, and we just have to wait in line, um, unless I declare an emergency because it's an infant without any access,